Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's good to see you. Um, uh, since I last saw you, I, I, I became um, um, a father-in-law, officially. Uh, so I'm so thankful uh, for the wedding of my daughter uh, to an amazing man, Dominic Hamoudi. And I just shout out to them on their honeymoon, and um, Dom and Hannah, I love ya. Yeah, yeah, can't believe my little girl is now married. Anyway, good to see you all. I hope you're doing well. And here we are just continuing to do these, these messages, virtually, if you will. And we're in the Gospel of Matthew. So, Open your Bibles. We'll be opening to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. It's a Sermon on the Mount. It's what is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's really Jesus' manifest, manifesto for a whole new way of being human in the inbreaking of the reality of the kingdom of God. You could call the Sermon on the Mount that, but I think we'll just keep it simple and call it it's the Sermon on the Mount. Mm. Okay. Let's look at the beginning of this sermon. Uh, it begins with something many of us are familiar with, and that's the challenge in preaching it, uh, the Beatitudes. Let's take a look at it. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a strange, odd, brilliant, provocative way to start a sermon with a list of blessings. And we often refer to them as what? As in Latin, Beatitudes, a name we're very familiar with. In Greek, it's makarios. You see that together with me, makarios. Makarios is not, though, this is interesting, not associated with God's bestowal of blessings. You know, God has so blessed me. That is not the word that Jesus is using here in the Beatitudes. Okay, so hold on to that. Because there's another Greek word that associates the bestowal of, of God's blessings. Uh, the other Greek word for, for blessed or blessing is eulogio. Okay, eulogio. Eulogio is associated with um, God bestowing blessings. I've been so blessed by God. Eulogio. Okay. Not, that's not the word that Jesus uses, though, in the Beatitudes. It's makarios. Okay. We'll look at this further. So hang in there. Other than makarios being translated into English as blessed, it also can be translated as happy or fortunate. Um, kind of a throw a party congratulations kind of word is what it is. Hmm. Uh, you know, when, when you can use makarios when someone has just got engaged or got married or is uh, having a baby or a new job. And it can also be used if you're just being envious and jealous towards someone. Makarios, I'm so happy for your new life. Your life is so wonderful, unlike mine. Makarios. I mean, people can use it that way, you know. Uh, Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount using this word makarios over and over and over again for eight types of people. And it's kind of a bizarre list, if you think about it. Poor in spirit, and those who mourn, and those who are meek, and those who hunger and thirst. Now, if you're new to the Sermon on the Mount, you're thinking Jesus is a bit off here in beginning the sermon with this list of Beatitudes. This is a list of blessings. Mm. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the most misread of Jesus' teachings. Okay. 
first what this list of Beatitudes is not. Okay? I'm going to walk through that a little. The list of Beatitudes is not intended to be given by Jesus as a list of virtues. Many, uh, I've seen many people, and you know, agree to disagree here, I've seen many scholars do these exegetical gymnastics, these interpretive gymnastics, seemingly twisting these blessings into virtues, like the poor in spirit being one who is truly dependent upon God, uh, who knows how bad they truly need God, that they're empty of everything but God. Uh, not a bad thing, but that's not where Jesus is going. A mournful, you know, those who mourn. You know, some say, well, those are people who mourn over their sin. Hmm. Or the meek are people who have a power, but do not use it over others. People who can squash others, but choose not to. They have self-discipline. And so they are deemed to be meek. Okay. And there are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That is uh, often interpreted as those who ache more for God, more of God, if you will. Okay? All good stuff. But I do not believe this is what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes. A lot of people and scholars will disagree with me. I'm just offering this for food for thought. Jesus, when he says, for instance, poor in spirit, he's using the Greek word dokos. A person who lives hand to mouth, living in abject poverty, who is on the brink of starvation. Poor in spirit is a phrase uh, is in reference to one who is a pauper, a person of beggar status, who feels they have nothing to offer, a value to offer at a material or spiritual level. So when Jesus says poor, he means poor, you know, not this just kind of, you know, symbolic kind of poor or poverty. He means poor, all right? And is poverty good or bad? And it's bad, right? Yeah. No. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. But this is people who are simply grieving, people who are depressed, people who are sad, period. You know, no... Interpretive gymnastics there, pretty straightforward. And then he says, blessed are the meek. Praise in Greek means a gentle, mild person who is often taken advantage of, oppressed. One who experiences injustice. Hmm. Jesus is really saying here, blessed are the powerless. Blessed are people who have no power at all. Huh. You know, Jesus is speaking to people who are living under the oppressive Roman Empire. And he's speaking to people in particular who are in the northern part of Israel, kind of in the countryside, um, lower economic part of the, the land of Israel, uh, far from the power seat and control that is wielded in the city of Jerusalem in the south. Jesus is speaking to peasant farmers who are in debt, who are taxed anywhere from 70 to 90% of their income. We complain. Imagine that. And they don't see the benefits, for the most part, of those taxes. The Roman citizens do. Um, there's nothing good, okay, here going on about what the meek are experiencing. And then, and then Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, the word for righteousness, dik a yu suni. Dik a yu suni. Okay. Hmm. A person who hungers for a healthy relationship with people, a healthy relationship with themselves, and with creation around them. In our language, this would be a person who does not have their life altogether. This would be a person who hungers for better relations in this world, uh, but they are, they are suffering. To be like a, just for example, perhaps a pregnant um, drug addict who's, uh, you know, who already has two kids who've been placed in foster care because of their addiction. But this person hungers, hungers for her life to get together. 
Now, altogether there are eight blessings in this list of Beatitudes. And there's a distinction between the first four and the second four Beatitudes. Each section of each four Beatitudes has 36, is written in 36 words in Greek. And the first four all start with the Greek letter phi. And the first four are definitely not virtues. The last four, the second four, are closer to being virtuous, you know, blessed are the merciful, elemeon, elemon, I'm sorry, uh, which means to be compassionate, certainly can be virtuous. Those who are pure in heart, katharoi, cardia, which means a person with clean thoughts and feelings. Blessed are the peacemakers. Aroi uh, nopois in Greek, meaning really one who is a pacifist. That sounds good, but in Jesus' day, uh, such a peacemaker, such a pacifist was looked down upon by many, was seen by many in society, in the Jewish society, as a first century Benedict Arnold, because they were a traitor to the cause of the violent overthrow of Rome. And then there's blessed are the persecuted for standing up for justice. While the last four in particular certainly have some virtuous characteristics, I need to make it really clear here, when Jesus spoke them, this list is not intended to be a list of virtues. Nor, nor is this list intended uh, to be a series of commands. You know, this is what you must be like in order to be blessed. It's like you're earning your blessings. That was not the teachings of Jesus. I was in a prayer meeting many years ago. I think it was in Baltimore, Maryland. And with other ministers, we were praying through the Beatitudes. And I'm here thinking, I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be oppressed. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to be persecuted. Is this what it means to be blessed? I really don't want any of this. Okay. Nor are these Beatitudes, this list of blessings, um, nor are they a list of timeless truths. For example, I mean, consider how the world operates, all right? Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, the meek don't always inherit the earth. I mean, as far as from an earthly perspective. A New York Times article back in September of 2012 uh, said this, typically it's not the meek, but the brilliant jerks that run the world who inherit the earth. thought about uh, the District of Columbia, D.C. It's not a place where meekness is kind of at the top of, of a uh, character trait. I mean, those who run our country, let's be honest, are usually the rich, the powerful, often Ivy League and educated, people with friends in high places, people who will lie and cheat and steal and put out propaganda and uh, self-promote themselves they are the ones who presently, really, in many instances, are inheriting the earth. And let's face it, often get elected to office. Do the merciful also, think about the merciful, do they really always receive mercy? No. No, they don't. I mean, read as statements of fact and truth, these beatitudes do not hold water when applied to the ways of the world. So. What are these Beatitudes? What are the Beatitudes if they, are, if they are not primarily virtues, commands, or truths? This is what they are, okay? They're good news, which literally means gospel, okay? Uh, Jesus defined gospel in the Gospel of Matthew, appropriately enough, in Matthew chapter three, verse two, this is what he said. Jesus defined the gospel as repent, but the kingdom of heaven has come near. You see, what Jesus is doing with this list of Beatitudes, he is saying that the kingdom has come near for the least likely people, the poor, the sad, the meek, the powerless, the people who don't have it together. Such people are blessed in the kingdom of God and wrapped up in this new reality of Jesus bringing to bear in the world his kingdom. And 
these individuals, none of us need to do anything to have it show up. That we are filled with grace. It's all grace, but we have to receive it. People in Jesus' day would push back on Jesus' reasoning with this list. I mean, I think in the same way many people push back on that whole phrase, Black Lives Matter. Jesus is not saying only the poor and only the oppressed are blessed. But because of their circumstances, because of the present status in life and social perspective of them, people in Jesus' society need to be reminded, reminded that such people who are often marginalized and looked down upon are beloved by God. In the same way, Black Lives Matter doesn't say only Black Lives Matter. No one's saying that. But because of circumstances in society, because of the way history continues to have itself play out, there's a need to expressly lift up the beauty and the value of certain lives in our society, not over and above others, but along with others in a very direct way way. The gospel is basically this. Hey you, your life's a mess, right? Mm, mm. So come to the kingdom. Blessed are you. You're a mess. You're, you're not successful in a world in the worldly sense or with worldly power. You're poor materially and, or, or spiritually. You know, come on in. You're blessed. Yeah. You're blessed. Now you are being offered a whole new way of being human to others. In the Beatitudes, Jesus radically redefines who actually is blessed. It's a countercultural list of people who were the exact opposite of what that first century Jew often viewed as a blessed life. Let me share with you from the book of Sirach. Uh, written around 175 BC as part of the Apocrypha, uh, a, a text, a collection of sacred writings that did not make it into the canon, into what we refer to as the Bible. Often you will find the Apocrypha uh, placed in between the Old and New Testament. And we see in the book of Sirach a perspective of what were the social blessings not only in 175 BC in first century in, in, in Israel, but also what the social blessings were, how they were deemed in the first century of Jesus' day. Let's look at what the blessings were in the book of Sirach. I can think of nine whom I would call blessed, and a tenth my tongue proclaims, a man who can rejoice in his children. So first you've got to be a man to be part of this list of blessings from Sirach. Okay? Just saying. Then he goes on to say, a man who lives to see the downfall of his foes. So anyone who's been against you, they're going to be wiped out. Yeah, that's a blessing. And happy is the man who lives with a sensible wife. Well, of course, our wives have to be sensible, right? And, goes on, and the one who does not plow with the ox and ass together, which I just always hate when I'm out in the field plowing and I have an ox and an ass, right? But what he is saying here also basically is this is, you know, you're blessed because you're a person of wealth. You can afford two oxes rather than, you know, having two asses, whatever. We'll leave that alone. Happy is the one who does not sin with the tongue. I mean, you speak very well. You Twitter very coherently. Okay. And, and the one who is not served and inferior. So you are on your A game. And you have never had to serve under someone. You are kind of the top dog. So you have a blessed life. And happy is the one who finds a friend. That is, you know. People want to be your friend. And, and, and the one who speaks to attentive listeners. This is someone who people want to come and listen to and, you know, and hear them speak, which I would love to experience that. And, and, and how great is the one who finds wisdom? But none is superior to the one who fears the Lord. For Sirach, this is a list of Beatitudes that would have, was alive and well in first century Israel in our Lord's day. Sounds great especially if you're a man, all right? But this is not Jesus' list of blessings. Let me offer to you, and it's just my stab at it, a loose paraphrase of our Lord's Beatitudes, uh, a list of the Beatitudes for our day, 
You ready? You sure? Okay, here we go. Blessed are the down and the out, the unemployed, the underemployed, those displaced from neighborhoods because of skyrocketing rental rates, those without college degrees or health insurance, those who feel they have very little to offer, they are in the kingdom of God. Blessed are the sad, the depressed, those grieving a death or, or failure of mar marriage, another miscarriage, pain from generational poverty, those targeted because of the color of their skin or illegal status. You are beloved by God. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessed are the quiet, the shy, the socially awkward, the uncool, the badly dressed, the people with five followers on Twitter because one day you'll be free from the tyranny of what other people think of you and you'll be embraced as a son or daughter of God. Blessed are the messed up, those who can't get it together, the addict, the mentally unstable, those from abusive homes. For you, one day, will be so full of God's life that you won't know where to put it all. Blessed is the little guy who gets stomped on, passed over, ref refusing to fight violence with violence. One day, you'll get all the mercy back with interest. Blessed are those who want nothing to do with America's wars or violence in the name of democracy and freedom, who know the true source of peace and prosperity isn't a gun or an army, and they are willing to suffer to bring a new world to bear. One day in the future, everybody will recognize that they are most like God. And blessed are the Christians in the post-Christian world that's hostile to all they believe, even though they are made fun of, looked down on as out of touch and behind the times. They get to share in the cross-shaped life of Jesus and the kingdom of God. We have to understand, Jesus' Beatitudes were very radical in his day and age, and a lot of people would have had significant issues with his revolutionary ideas of who was truly blessed. You know, I love this nation of ours, and it hurts to see what's been happening to it. I think it does for all of us. Our nation, though, and oversimplified, but our nation is like this social experiment based upon and built upon the pursuit of happiness. Yes, we are a nation under God, but for many, if not most people, it's a God that we trust in as long as he's on the almighty dollar. It appears that what many associate with happiness is not aligned with what Jesus associates with happiness. We've redefined what happiness means over the past 200 years, uh, really to just feeling good about ourselves and our situation in life. But there are all sorts of problems with this. As social scientists say, 50% of our happiness is the result of genetics. That is, 50% of us are born happy. The rest of us, well, we kind of hate you, all right? You know. It's kind of like Marcarios, congratulations, I'm so happy you've been born happy and I don't have your genetic code. Marcarios, right? Mm. But secondly, happiness is also about comparing ourselves to others, about keeping up with or pursuing or passing by the Joneses on the street. But for millennia, human beings were happy without running water, without electricity and sewer systems no iPhones. What has happened, though, is that expectations have raised a bit and have changed with respect now to what makes us happy. Happiness is like this uh, hedonic treadmill. Okay. It's hedonism in many ways, always striving for the latest and the bestest, right? And bestest, it's a word. Happiness actually comes from the old English word happenstance. Happiness is dependent upon your stance. That is where you stand in life. Unfortunately, where a lot of us stand is out of our control. So things go well, you know, for a while. You're happy until they don't, and then you're not. Mm. I mean, a new job, the wedding ring, before you know it, the endless honeymoon period is over with, and you're determined to live in it, but it becomes more and more of a distant memory. Happiness, the kind of happiness many of us follow, rises and falls with the stock market. Frightening these days, 
is the delight that many people have in dismissing or putting down other people. It's an insidious happiness. I see this especially like in political rallies. You know, and people who are leading those rallies calling other people slow or nasty or stupid. And then people all around that, that speaker are laughing and cheering and egging him, him or her on, right? It's a happiness built on demeaning others. It's just mean and cruel, and people are loving it. It's a happiness that others, at the expense of others. Jesus is the polar opposite of such happiness. Jesus is saying, you're poor, you're sad, you're oppressed, you don't have it all together. Makarios, you are blessed, not because of your challenges or circumstances in life, but because to God, you are so much more than your circumstances. You are God's beloved. Now, if life's going well, and you don't find yourself on this list of Beatitudes, okay? If life's going well for you, you're not mourning, you're not poor in spirit, celebrate it. But please don't feel entitled. I encourage you to feel gratitude and a responsibility to share your blessings. What would it look like for you to leverage your blessings so you can share them with others who are going through a tough season? We live in a society enamored with success. And it's like this linear upward trajectory you know, towards more money, more power, and more prestige than the previous year. And this kind of attitude of success seeps in the church life. Honestly, from that perspective of what success is from a worldly point of view, I don't know if I've ever been at a successful church. Maybe that says more about me than, than the church. But so often what the church focuses on to be successful is more people and more money and larger buildings. Of course that's successful. Look at that large church. They're more successful than we are. In a worldly, by worldly standards, absolutely. You know, that hipster, millennial, you know, concert experience church that's out there, you know, yeah, look at that, it's really rocking, right? Mm. They're so successful. Why can't we be like them? I mean, you can be if you want. But the church, I, how do I put this? Is in danger of equating worldly success with faithfulness. The most faithful church I've ever been a part of was anything but successful from a worldly viewpoint. But it was faithful because it lived with an awareness that it was blessed. Not with money, not with a dynamic choir or sound system or lighting system or pastor, but with people who saw each other truly as brothers and sisters in Christ, as part of God's family, period. And they saw Christ in whoever walked into that, that church building, and they greeted and welcomed and cared for each other as if they were Christ himself. Because deep down, they truly believed that. And that church was my home church, Mount Rainier Christian Church. They have modeled for me the kind of success that Jesus would desire in any church body. That linear life of more, that it goes upward of more and more, that leads to worldly success of wealth and health and beauty, it will fade. Jesus shows another way. He says, we are blessed not in spite of our pain, but in our pain. Now, when I say blessed, I don't mean Jesus is saying, oh, count your blessings, look on the bright side. No, he's not going there. Jesus is saying, there's a blessing for you, and you'll receive it in 
your pain, perhaps even in spite of your pain, or perhaps even because of your pain. And I'm not saying that pain or poverty is a good thing. I'm saying that somewhere under the rubble of life, there is a blessing for you. Jesus, people came to Jesus on that mountainside when he was given a sermon on the mount. People came to him poor, and they walked down that mountainside poor, but now they were blessed. They walked up that mountainside grieving, perhaps because of the loss of a loved one. They walked down that mountainside grieving, but now blessed. They walked up that mountainside to sit and listen to him oppressed by the Roman Empire. They walked back down. Rome was still in power, but now they were blessed. Are you getting where Jesus is coming from? Blessed are you, Makarios. Blessed are you to be satisfied and secure in the midst of life's circumstances because you are sensing the indwelling presence of God. This is what Jesus is getting at with this list of Beatitudes. And you know who gets this, and I say this with all the respect I can muster. You know who really gets this? Our parents with special needs children. I mean, there is a brutal, a brutal honesty of grief and lament over the challenges that their children have to conquer each and every day. But I see a perseverance and a patience and love in those families for those children, children that are often pitied and ignored or looked down on by much of society. And I see these parents in, in that environment making sacrifices, not with regret, but with joy. Not because they have to care for their children, but because they get to. I've watched not only amazing parents, but I see within my own family, therapists and teachers fighting tooth and nail for these kids. Doing everything they can within the school system to have the community see these kids as a blessing. Not because that child has CP or Down syndrome or autism. None of that is a good thing. It isn't. Those things are grieved. But the child, oh, the child is celebrated. If you find yourself on this list of Beatitudes of our Lord's, there's a blessing for you today and hope for tomorrow. Because one day all the tears, all the sadness, it will cease to exist. There will be a day we will no longer grieve the illness or disability or, the, or death. And one day Jesus will reign over all and everything God has intended will unfold. And there will not be a gap between rich and poor. There'll be no more pain, no more racism. And the old order of life that has been built upon worldly success will pass away. And the kingdom of God and all of its fullness will fill the air we breathe. And there will be room for everyone around that banquet table. Until then, till then, Jesus wants you to know, Makarios, blessed are you. Blessed are you, child of God. Amen. God bless you.